The German war machine's efforts to turn the tide of conflict in their favour have given rise to numerous tales involving advanced and dangerous weaponry. But amidst the rumours of alien technology and paranormal experimentation, one story in particular stands out. That of a mysterious machine, the ultimate purpose of which remains an enduring enigma. What was Die Glocke? The testing facility was situated a short distance away from the Czechoslovakian border and was known to its inhabitants as Derisa, or the Giant. The soldiers stationed there had little knowledge about what the scientists in their charge were working on, other than that it was rumoured to possess the potential to turn the tide of war. The soldiers were both well equipped and provisioned, to a far higher standard than the rest of the Wehrmacht, but few of them had seen active service. Most had spent the entirety of their short military careers protecting secret projects such as this. The sound of the artillery fire that was gradually creeping ever closer caused them no small amount of anxiety. Safe behind the perimeter of overlapping barbed wire fences and reinforced concrete machine gun nests, the scientists went about their business in a deliberate and methodical fashion. Their concern over the approaching Russians was only secondary. The risk of making a mistake using the highly volatile materials they were working with bore a far greater threat than any advancing army. The doors to the main hangar were opened, and a new group of test subjects were ushered inside. They were referred to by those in charge as volunteers, but in reality, the only reason they were here was because the alternative would have been a long drop from the end of a short rope. Few things in life motivated an individual more than the prospect of a death sentence. Once the last of the group was inside, the guards retreated, locking the doors behind them as they withdrew. High up above in the viewing platform, the assembled scientists and military officers watched on dispassionately as the small throng of men slowly made their way through the room's sprawling interior towards the odd-looking object in the centre. Momentarily, a technician threw the switch, which activated a nearby power source, and after a few moments, a faint thrumming noise could be heard coming from inside the strange object. The men standing close to it glanced nervously at one another, as the sound began to grow in both volume and intensity. From their elevated position, the observers noticed the air immediately around the object starting to shimmer and blur. Suddenly, one of the volunteers dropped to the floor, his legs buckling beneath him. He had made no sound as he had fallen, but his collapse caused the others to cry out in a mixture of fear and surprise. Some started to back away from the object, whilst others bolted back towards the doors. The incessant vibrations continued to increase, and more of the panicked men began to stumble and fall. After a few minutes, it was all over, with the last of the test subjects now lying motionless on the ground. The signal to cut the power was given, and the deafening hum began to subside. As the soldiers re-entered the hangar and set about recovering the liquefied bodies that now lay scattered around, several technicians in white lab coats made their way directly towards the object. A glass cylinder of dark red fluid was removed from inside and whisked away for further analysis. The results of the experiment were mixed. Whilst they had successfully obtained the results they were after, it was clear that the efforts to enhance the object's external shielding had been far from sufficient, but this was of little consequence. More volunteers would be found, more material would be produced, and the Reich would be victorious. Testimony pertaining to the mysterious device known as Die Glocke, or the Bell, 
first surfaced in the Polish media in 2000, after a journalist named Igor Witkowski published a book detailing his investigation into the secretive experiment. The author stated that he had managed to gain access to confidential records belonging to his nation's military intelligence services, some of which detailed the post-war interrogation of an SS Gruppenführer by the name of Jakob Sporenberg. Witkowski's book, The Truth About the Wonder Weapon, enjoyed some brief success, but did not achieve widespread circulation. It was, however, read by a number of people outside its country of origin, one of whom was the British writer and ufologist Nick Cook. Witkowski's material was scarce and lacking in corroboration, but it intrigued Cook to the extent that he too began to investigate the reports, determined to bring the story to an international audience. Buried within the depositions allegedly written by Sporenberg, before his appearance at Poland's war crime tribunals, was a lengthy description of a scientific apparatus, the existence of which the German government had apparently gone to great lengths to keep hidden from their opponents. This device was believed to have been used to produce an unknown fuel source, but was so hazardous to operate that it caused the deaths of many scientists who had worked on it. The machine was nicknamed the Bell because of its physical appearance. Sporenberg described it as being approximately 4 metres high and 2.5 metres wide, made entirely of metal with a hemispherical domed top. Huge amounts of power were needed in order to operate it, which in turn created a blue and violet haze around its hull. During the initial stages of its creation, the SS Lieutenant General explained that an invisible field was somehow generated around the apparatus, which extended out to roughly 200 metres. When plant and foliage samples were placed within this zone during the machine's operation, they would slowly decompose into a greasy organic fluid, but it was the effect it had on humans and animals in its immediate vicinity that was most horrific. The unknown forces being emitted from inside the device somehow formed solid crystals in the tissue of any living creature exposed to it. The bloodstreams of these unfortunate victims would clot and solidify into a thick, gel-like compound causing a near instantaneous and agonising death. Once the machine was switched off, the blood would then naturally return to its liquid state, pouring out of the bodies and pooling on the floor around them. This process would allegedly kill five out of seven of the original scientists assigned to the project, until an effective means was found which could shield them from its effects. It remains unknown exactly what this force was, but Sporenberg states that it was powerful enough to lift the device up off the ground for short periods of time, allowing it to hover a few feet in the air. Inside its metal housing were two cylinders, which were designed to rotate around one another in an anti-clockwise direction at great speed when the power was switched on. Unknown substances were added to these cylinders, which in turn went on to achieve the experiment's ultimate goal, the creation of an unknown crimson-coloured fluid. Many have speculated that the compound which de Glocker produced was red mercury, a theoretical material believed to boost the fission power of nuclear weapons. Other commentators keen to point out that there has never been a verified example of red mercury being created or analysed have instead theorised that the machine was some form of rudimentary particle accelerator. It is possible that the Germans managed to obtain samples of thorium, which the process was able to convert into a further material known as protactinium. This substance would naturally start to deteriorate immediately at the point of creation, meaning that after approximately a month, it would degrade into what was effectively weapons-grade uranium. The Reich's efforts to secure the material needed in order to manufacture atomic weaponry are well documented, and so this theory about the Bell's true purpose is realistic. An alternative hypothesis is that the Germans were looking to solve another pressing issue that was impairing their ability to continue the war, the need to find a form of sustainable and renewable energy. Even from the outset of World War II, Germany was woefully short of the basic resources needed to power its military might. As the conflict continued, her scientists were locked in a perpetual struggle to combine their existing fuel sources into innovative new compounds and applications, but none proved practical for widespread usage. Other theories about the mechanics behind Die Glocke prove far more fantastic and terrifying. 
Some suggest that the harmful field it generated may indeed have been fully intentional, and that the Germans hope to mass-produce these devices and then activate them on the front lines. The subsequent mass casualties caused by this action would not only have been catastrophic to the armies of their opponents, but would also have given the Reich a huge psychological edge. The fact that the device was witnessed hovering above the ground has led many to theorise that it may have been some form of anti-gravity technology, intended to power a generation of new fighter aircraft such as the Hornaboo. But by far the most terrifying potential application of the device comes from the testimony of a scientist named Otto Czerny. Czerny was one of a number of German academics who were taken back to the United States after the war under Project Paperclip, where they were utilised in the American rocket programme. It is alleged that Czerny stated that the Bell had the ability to show the operators images from the past and future, via a concave mirror that had been mounted upon it. This raises the horrifying prospect that the Germans had somehow stumbled across the ability to move through time, and that Die Glocke was a prototype for a working time machine. As ridiculous as this sounds, who knows what the world would be like today if the Reich had succeeded in altering the past. There is no photographic or scientific evidence to prove that Die Glocke ever existed. Skeptics believe the stories were merely the efforts of a disgraced war criminal attempting to curry favour with his captors. But when certain elements of the device's story are subjected to closer analysis, it is startling how they corroborate with what we do know about the closing days of World War II. The remains of the testing facility referred to in Sporenberg's testimony can still be visited, situated not far from the town of Ludwikowice in Poland. Deep tunnels were dynamited into the bowels of the nearby Wash mine to hide the activities of the German scientists from Allied aerial reconnaissance, but it is the presence of two decaying concrete structures at the site which is most intriguing. Both consist of a series of concentric concrete posts, laid out in similar fashion to the stone circles found at Stonehenge in Great Britain. This has earned them the nickname of the Henges. It is not known exactly what their true purpose was, but some believe they may have been testing rigs, which Die Glocke was tethered to when in use. Jakob Sporenberg spent the majority of the war in charge of SS policing units in the Lublin district of Poland, but in 1944, he and the majority of his staff were transferred to Norway. The reason it is difficult to write his testimony off as pure fabrication is that it is subsequently corroborated by another German officer, Hauptsturmführer Rudolf Schuster. Schuster was similarly stationed in Lublin during the war, but was later captured by American forces. During his post-war interrogation in Berlin, completely independently of Sporenberg, he also described Die Glocke to his captors. Schuster explained that as Russian forces had neared the testing facility, he had supervised the evacuation of both the device and the technicians working on it to an unknown location. Of particular interest in the story of Die Glocke, is the senior officer allegedly attached to the project, an SS general by the name of Hans Kammler. Kammler was ambitious and despicably loyal to the Nazi regime, and in the closing stages of the war, he had managed to gain control of Hitler's wonder weapon programs. In March 1945, Kammler had ordered his men to open fire on a convoy of refugees who were blocking his passage through the Arnsberg forest. 200 men, women and children died and Kamler would become one of the most sought-after fugitives for war crimes investigators. He apparently committed suicide as his pursuers closed in on him, and was declared legally dead three years after the war ended. Kamler's body was never found, and reports that he had successfully found his way to South America, or had been extracted by US agents to assist with Project Paperclip, continued to surface. Like most other military forces at the time, his command had been broken up and redistributed into other units as the German armies had retreated, and so it is impossible to know the true fate of him and the soldiers under his command. Post-war records have indicated that as late as April 1945, General Kammler and approximately 600 of his staff had made their way from Poland into Austria, accompanied by lorries filled with equipment. By the time American infantry units had entered the region, all trace of him and whatever he was escorting had vanished. Reports linking Hans Kammler to Austria are of particular interest, due to the stories and legends associated with the Untersberg region of the country. 
For centuries there have been tales of groups of people disappearing or experiencing time slips in the Untersberg Mountains. And in 2011, a book by an author named Stan Wolf made a startling claim. Wolf stated witness testimony from shepherds in the region who were said to have seen a force of Nazi soldiers walk directly into a wall of solid rock, never to be seen again. Another witness allegedly encountered young German soldiers living in the mountain's cave network, aging at an inexplicably slow rate, seemingly unaware that the war they were fighting had been lost. Is it possible that Kammler and his scientists had sufficiently mastered Die Glocke to allow them to escape the Allied forces, travelling either forwards or backwards in time to evade them? This certainly sounds an outlandish claim, were it not for the events that would occur in the Pennsylvanian village of Kecksburg 20 years after the war ended. On the afternoon of December the 9th, 1965, radar operators tracked an object falling from the skies above Kecksburg. The local authorities were quick to secure the crash site of this object and recover it before members of the press could access the location. From the limited testimony of those who witnessed the object's recovery, it bears a staggering resemblance to Jakob Sporenberg's description of Die Glocke, a metal craft shaped like a bell and covered in strange runes and hieroglyphs. It is speculated that Die Glocke somehow travelled forwards in time from 1945, materialised in orbit above the Earth, and accidentally crash-landed in North America. Another idea is that Allied forces successfully recovered both Hans Kammler and his technology from Nazi Germany, and that the Kecksburg crash was the result of American experimentation with the Bell. It is highly unlikely that we will ever have a definitive answer on whether Die Glocke ever existed, or is merely a tall tale which has since taken on a life of its own. All we can do is continue to follow a frustrating and disjointed trail of evidence, which stubbornly suggests that there may indeed be some degree of truth behind the tale. Looking broadly at German weapons experiments of the era, and discounting those stories alleged to involve extraterrestrial technology or satanic rituals, it is not beyond all possibility that German scientists managed to create a weapon system far ahead of its time. But until any concrete evidence comes to light... All we can do is wonder.